that was so awesome to see all of those uh, babies up here on the stage. It reminded me, after I recovered from just the sheer cuteness of it all, uh, my own kids. I have a six-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son, and I remember when Abby was born, our first kid, uh, especially when uh, Brianna was pregnant, just leading up to that day, uh, all of these things I was being told that I would experience leading up to fatherhood, you know, and, and the birth of our kid. And I was told all of this stuff, you're going to have this incredible deep connection and your heart is just going to be palpitating and uh, you're just, there's, it's just going to be this magical moment and this bond. And I remember when my daughter was born, Brianna felt that bond. I felt a lot of terror and confusion. I remember leaving Cottage Hospital in the car, uh, looking in my rearview mirror at this, this uh, human being in the back seat with a bobblehead and remembering, like, they didn't give me, like, a manual. Like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. And I literally begin YouTubing fatherhood material. Like, okay, here's how you feed, here's what you do. And just for many months, I just remembered never having that magical connection that all these other dads were telling me I would have right off the bat. Uh, it was messy, it was loud, it was difficult. I, I loved my family, my daughter, uh, the way that you love your daughter, uh, but that magical connection that I'd always been hearing about, uh, I just didn't feel it, I guess, is the right word. Uh, I didn't understand it until about four months later. What changed? I was holding my daughter, four months old, in my arms that day, and I looked down, and for the first time, she looked at me back. And instead of crying, instead of spitting on me, instead of uh, motioning for mom, instead of me, she looked at me, locked her eyes on me, and smiled. And I lost it. <laughs> I've been losing it for six years. And in the aftermath of that simple little smile, I found myself doing things that I never thought I would do. Uh, I started making noises that I would never make in public. I would do what they call, I don't know what they, the cooing or cawing or whatever it's called. I would make these noises. I was like, uh, uh. <laughs> like I'd just be making a fool of myself. I'd grab like stuffed animals and I'd start shaking them. I'm an introverted person. I have dignity and I lost it all just to get one more smile. I lost it after that. One little interaction with my daughter and I lost it. And those interactions would just intensify. The smile would turn into a giggle and the giggle would turn into a grab of my finger and the grab of my finger would turn into uh, kicks and pushes as she got older and piggyback rides and laughter and so on and so forth. And I began living for those types of interactions. What, what changed uh, between me and my daughter? A simple interaction. I say all of this because perhaps you're here this morning and you feel the same way about your prayer life. I'd have to believe that you are in a church today in some part because you want a meaningful relationship with God. You want to know that you are connected to Him, that you can speak to Him and He'll speak back. And you probably intuitively know at so, in some part of your mind that that relationship with God has something to do with prayer. And yet you might also simultaneously be sitting in the seat in a theater in Santa Barbara wanting to know God intimately, knowing that prayer probably has something to do with it, but struggling with prayer, struggling with prayer. I want to ask you, and for the duration of what I'm going to speak to you from John chapter 15. What if prayer was not primarily about all of those other things that we make it into? And we have a lot of things, right? Which I'm going to talk about. What if prayer was simply an interaction with God, like I had with my daughter and continue to have? What if you could interact with the God of your salvation? Prayer is a struggle, it's often hard, it's confusing. There's a lot of obstacles. What gets in the way of prayer? Well, I took a survey earlier this week on Facebook, so you know it's all true. And I just asked. About 80 people responded to me, a lot of them from this church. Some of them around the city, some of them uh, far and wide, and I was struck by the diversity of people who spoke. There were kids, there were teenagers, there were college students. 
There were people who barely knew God. There were people who had been walking with God for years, men, women. There were people uh, working uh, in various fields, but there were also people with advanced degrees in spirituality. There were senior pastors, people on church staffs, and everything in between. And I was struck by the rawness and the honesty of people as they shared some of the difficulties with prayer. And as I began reading through those 80 comments, I found myself a little less alone as I went down each one and said, oh yeah, I totally resonate with that. Oh yeah, that happened last week. <laughs> oh yeah, that's, I'm going through that right now. I took those 80 and I tried to turn them into about four basic ideas. And I'm going to walk through them and see if you resonate with some of them. Here's the first one. A lot of people felt ashamed in their prayer life. Shame. Uh, and it was for a variety of reasons, but the, the basic sense was, I don't deserve to come before God or I'm, I'm doing it wrong. One person shared, uh, it's been so long since I've prayed that I feel like I can't even start anyway. You ever feel that way? You've been so out of the loop with God, like you feel ashamed to even approach him in the, uh, at all. One person shared, if, if I do pray, I feel like it needs to be longer than two to five minutes, which is what I have right now. <laughs> and so I just don't even pray for the two to five minutes. Other people expressed how they felt prayer was ineffective and pointless. Even though they might have scriptural answers for why we should pray, intuitively they felt like they didn't see any value in it, that it doesn't work. One person shared, uh, if God's just going to do what he's going to do, what's the point of asking him to do something else? He's just going to do what he's going to do. Another woman shared about how her mom died of cancer despite her prayers. And that left her with a, a, a singing feeling in her stomach. Why, why would I ever ask him to do anything? Again, and also her, her years of healing from that. Her vulnerability and her uh, desire again to step out in prayer. But these are some of the things that people brought up. They're ashamed. I don't feel like I deserve to pray or I feel like I'm doing it wrong. Other people shared how they felt like it was ineffective. They're, they didn't see the value in speaking to God or that it just didn't work. And I'm not here to solve all of those problems today. But perhaps to start with this, to give them validity as I, uh, as I was able to get, as I read them, like this is real, this is what we face, and it's okay to talk about it. Sometimes spirituality is a wrestling match. I felt a little bit of freedom in that. I don't know if some of you did, some of you who posted, and that you're probably not the only person, apparently, that struggles with prayer. I'm not here to solve those things, to speak endlessly about why some prayers don't get answered the way that we want. I've done that before, and that's not, uh, that's not my intent today. What I want to do is continue to bring us back to the core of prayer, to remind you what it deeply means and how that might form you as you wrestle through it. What if prayer meant that you could have an interaction with God? What if prayer was more than just a pragmatic transaction with a being that you've never met before and don't know? What if it was, in the truest sense, an interaction with a divine being? I don't know about you, but I've prayed prayers that didn't get answered the way that I wanted them to, to, to be answered. I don't know about you, but I have felt ashamed in my prayer life. And I don't have any pat answers for some of those things, but I can tell you this. If I knew that God was on the other end of the line, I'd be able to say, hey, if that's not what you have for my life, it's okay, as long as you're in it. If I knew that God was at the other end of the line, I would feel a little less shame than before. 
It's for that reason that I want to impress on your heart. What if prayer had to do with an interaction? Sure, all of those things are real and valid, but what if the deepest thing about your prayer life was that you could reach out and touch God and he could touch you back? What if the deepest thing about your prayer life, aside from all of those other things, was that you could look at the face of God and he could look back and smile at you? Wasn't that Aaron's prayer in the book of Numbers? May God, may God's face shine upon you and give you peace. May he lift his countenance, his face upon you and be gracious to you. May your God smile upon you. If you had that, how would it change the way that you sought God in prayer? Like a laser shooting through our pragmatics and our transactions is Jesus' words and invitation in John chapter 15, verse 4, to abide in me. This is Jesus' definition of what prayer is. All of those other things are real and necessary, but the deepest part of prayer is caught up in three words by your Jesus. Abide in me. You know what abide means? It means to stay. It means to stay there, to linger. It means to stay in a given place or in a given state or in a given relationship. Because of Jesus' background, uh, in first century Israel, who would have walked everywhere, uh, who would have been deeply involved in hospitabil- uh, uh, ho- hospitability. Just made that up. You're welcome. <laughs> the word abide takes on an earthy tone. You could have read this in this way, to make your home somewhere. In this case, Jesus is literally inviting people to live with him, as one person put it. Or as another stated, it's a continued dependence on Jesus as one might continue to dwell in a shelter, to remain, to abide. How vivid that is after three three days of rain. For those of us, uh, what was your reaction as you were outside and the rain fell and you looked up at the sky and were like, what are these particles falling? Never seen this before. This is unprecedented. What did you do? Did you stay out in the rain? Maybe you did. That's awesome. Some of you ran indoors. You jumped into your car. You pulled your hoodie over your head. You ran into a place of shelter. This is the exact image that God has for you to be in such a dependence on another person that you run into him as a shelter. It's like your your natural response to anything. That's why when Jesus teaches his disciples about prayer, he seems to downplay the usage of words. Words words are necessary, but he takes us deeper than the words. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, he says, don't pray like the Pharisees. You know how they pray? They use many words because prayer for them is being heard by other people and recognized. But when you pray, Matthew 6, verse 6, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. Do you hear that? Remain in the secret place. And your Father who sees in the secret place will reward you. Sometimes prayer involves words, but it's deeper than that, isn't it? It's about a God who wants to interact with you in the secret place. Created you to interact with you in the secret place. Give you breath in your lungs just so that you could know him and interact with him and speak to him. Incredible. In verse 9, in that same chapter, he would then give them a model prayer that we know is the Lord's Prayer, right? Pray then like this, our Father in heaven. Not even going to read the rest of the passage because there's so much right there. Speak to him like he's your dad. This might be difficult if you've, had a, if you've had a bad relationship with your dad. And yet over and beyond our broken relationships is a true father who says, I want to know you like my son, like my daughter. Pray then like this, our father in heaven. This phrase might uh, perpetuate the cycle of our, our prayers that feel so distant from God because Heaven is so loaded with baggage for those of us that immediately get, uh, get this imagery of uh, a disconnected planet far off in another region. 
we read this prayer and we think Jesus is telling us, pray to our God who is far, far away. The original word for heaven that Jesus was using here, aranos, is in, is this, it literally means the sky. And it's in the plural. Jesus is telling us, pray then like this. Pray to our Father in the sky. Pray to our Father who is close by. Pray to your Father who is as close to you as the air that you're breathing. He's close. He's near to you. Open your mouth. Speak to him. He wants to hear what you have to say. These three verses show us a picture that we are to intentionally place ourselves in the presence of the one who is as close to us as the air that we're breathing. To learn to depend on him and to be sustained by him in the moment. Prayer is a mutual interaction between you and God. This is why Paul would pray in Ephesians chapter 3, I pray that you would experience the love of Christ. Even though it's too great for you to understand fully, I pray that you would get a glimpse. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. One translation puts it this way. I pray that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. That's what prayer aspires to, that you would be able to reach out and touch God and he would touch you back. True, whole prayer, Augustine would say, is nothing but love. Prayer is an affair of love. Now later, I'm going to ask questions that I hope will draw out of you the experience of that love and prayer. But right now, just camp out right there. For those of you that feel ashamed that you've been doing it wrong, that you don't do it long enough, that you don't say the right words, that you've sinned too much on Saturday and so you shouldn't really pray on Sunday until you fix your life, all the things that crowd our minds that make us feel like we should cower in the presence of God, I pray that God, Jesus' words like lightning would open up the chasm of your shame and draw you out just a little bit more this morning. How? He loves you. How would your prayer life change if you knew that it was God himself that initiated the conversation? Abide in me and I in you. Another way to read that is abide in me as I abide in you. Jesus is the first one that initiates the relationship. He doesn't call you to reach him. He reaches out to you and he just says, open your eyes, I'm here. I'm in your living room. Ready to live life with you. Perhaps our shame could be met by the healing power of a God who loves you and has not required you to fix yourself up in order to know him. How does that change? How does the love of God change your understanding of what it means to pray? For some of us, here's the last two, uh, what keeps us from prayer is busyness. We can't make time. We have endless to-do lists, jobs, work, rent to be paid, mortgages to fill, kids to scrub and bathe and feed, crises to deal with, fires to put out, emergencies that happen almost on the tail end of our rare form of leisure. Anytime we sit down to do anything, it seems like there's something else competing for our time. And prayer, let's just be honest, is, is the path of uh, most resistance. So if our 24 hours is filled with a bunch of stuff, how can we choose? We tend to choose the emergencies, the urgencies. And prayer sometimes falls off to the wayside. I don't want you here to feel guilty about that. I want you to look for the bright spots. Because perhaps some of you are, have made in your mind a picture of what prayer is supposed to be like because you've seen somebody else do it. I need to pray for 60 minutes. Wow, I don't have time for that. I'm literally putting out a fire in my kitchen that my kids started. <laughs> but when you look through the scriptures, you see various ways that people have interacted with God, so many different ways. None of them seem to be the same. Whether it's Psalm 141, verse 1, where the psalmist is just, just 
crying out in emotional pain. It's prayer. Or in Acts chapter 4, verse 24, where people are coming together and praying together corporately, it's prayer. Or in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, when Paul says that we are to offer up our requests to God, just being real and honest and raw, that's prayer. Say, well, it seems so selfish, but it's still prayer. Why? Because we're interacting with God. Even when we're silent, it can be prayer. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 12, Elijah has an experience with God, and God sends to Elijah's way an earthquake, and yet he says, but God was not found in the earthquake. And then there was a blazing fire like Moses experienced, but God was not in the fire. And then there was a rushing wind, but God was not in the wind. And then in that last sentence in 1 Kings, it says, and then there was the sound of a thin silence. What's the sound of silence? I don't know. But it was right there in the silence that Elijah encountered the Lord. Sometimes prayer doesn't even involve your words. For those of you who have been exhausted by too many words, words that have been spoken to you, words that you have tried to get out, you find yourself not even knowing what to say. It's okay. Prayer is an interaction with God. Sometimes the best interactions take place in silence. Sometimes it's scripture. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, that when you're reading and meditating on the word, the morning star, a picture of Jesus, will rise in your heart. Sometimes it's just by opening this thing and asking God to speak through it, and he will. Other times it's by nature. Psalm chapter 19 says that the skies declare the glory of God. And you look at the expanse of things and you feel a little bit smaller. But maybe in your smallness and insignificance you also feel strangely warmed and comforted to know that the world doesn't revolve around you. That's prayer. Prayer is also listening. It doesn't always mean that we're talking. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10, Samuel was trained uh, by his mentor to say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. How many times do I, Chris Lazo, spend my waking moments talking to people and talking to God and talking to my problems when he's trying to talk back and I just can't hear him because I'm yabbering? Sometimes the sense of God's absence is prayer, believe it or not. Psalm chapter 22, verse 2, the psalmist says, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? Some of you, as you're listening to this explanation of prayer's interaction, are saying, I've been praying to God, and I have been interacting with nothing but loneliness and despair. Could it be that God is meeting you in that place just in a way that you don't yet understand at the moment? John of the Cross once described this, what we see in Psalm 22 as uh, the dark night of the soul. It's that moment in a Christian's life where the things that we're used to that give us pleasure and comfort, even spiritually, like in prayer, when we feel good, are stripped away. And for us, it feels like a loss. It feels like we're doing it wrong. It feels like God has abandoned us, and yet God will never forsake you or leave you, according to the book of Hebrews. So why do we have those times in our prayer life where we feel absent from God, or we feel like God is absent from us? Sometimes he's stripping us from the things that we are comfortable with because he wants us to take us into a deeper place of his love. And when we get through to that place, it'll be worth it. But right now we're in a season of darkness and despair and loneliness. But even that is prayer if we can learn not to run away from the situation but to say with the psalmist, where are you, God? If the essence of prayer is interaction with God, you can find a lot of ways of learning to do that. I recently asked uh, the staff at, at Reality SB, there's about nine of them, uh, when, was the, when was the last time you sensed God's presence in your life? And everybody's answer was different. And some of them were unconventional. 
One of them uh, said, it, uh, it was recently as I was walking along on the beach and I just sensed God's nearness. Another person shared how they were in a, 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 a relational conflict and they had to say something that was really hard and yet in that difficult situation, they sensed God's nearness, interaction with God. Who would have thought that something like a difficult conversation could be turned into prayer? Over and over, different examples of people interacting with God, and all of them is God reaching out to touch you. But how many of us, as God is, is, is interacting in your life, have missed it because we don't think that that's the real deal? Or we're busy, or we're distracted, or we think that it's ineffective, or we're doing it wrong, or we're ashamed when God is actually already present and working in your life. Some of you might say, my life is busy from 5 in the morning until 12 at night. I'm literally, every minute is accounted for, and I can't stop. What do I do? Turn your busyness into prayer. You don't have to retreat to some monastery on the top of the mountain. You don't have to find a beach. Turn whatever it is that you're going through into prayer. How do you turn that into prayer? Simply turn your attention to God. That could be in a hundred different ways. It could be you, you crying out, like, God, help me. It could you, be you just being silent for five seconds, centering yourself on the presence of God. It could, you, it could be you attempting to listen. It could be you just moving through that feeling of loneliness and absence, knowing that even though you don't see him and sense him, God is with you. Anything can be turned into prayer if you're turning your attention to God in it. Sometimes it involves words. Sometimes it involves pain. Sometimes it involves silence. But prayer is a mutual interaction with God. Even in your busyness, you can turn what you're struggling with towards God. Brother Lawrence, uh, the author of a spiritual classic called Practicing the Presence of God, uh, was not a full-time pastor. He wasn't a spiritual leader in the official sense of the word. He was a dishwasher, uh, and he was very busy. And he endeavored to say, I wonder if I can pray through my dishwashing. I know. I'm going to practice throughout uh, this, this next hour to turn my attention to God as I'm scrubbing this nasty thing. He got so good at it that he got to a place, and it took a long time, but he got to a place in his life where he could describe himself as practicing God's presence no matter what he was doing. A quote from Lawrence, the time of business does not with me differ from the time of prayer. Even when I'm working, I'm walking with God. These things don't come easy and they're not going to come overnight, but does that change anything about your understanding of prayer? For you to say, not only does God love me and he's initiated this relationship, but he wants me to interact with him in love. What can you do, even if it's small? What can you do right now, tomorrow, even if it's small, to begin to interact with God, even in the busyness and fast-paced nature of your life? The last one is distraction. This was by far the most popular. It's not that we are ashamed in our prayer life. It's not that we think our prayers aren't doing any good. And we may be busy, but we still find our, uh, an ability to carve out the time. It's that even when we carve out the time to be with God, we find our minds distracted by so many other things. We can't concentrate. Even if we were to carve out a time where we can focus on God, that's the problem. We just can't focus. And for you, it might be time to adopt something new in your life called rhythms. I say that because of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. He said this. He said, the spirit is willing. It's the flesh that's weak. Our hearts desperately want all of this. If you've been born of the Spirit, you've been born again, your heart desires relationship with God. It can't not desire that. That's where you get that inner craving. I want to be close to God. I want the things of God. That's all I want right now. That's not the problem, your inner life. The problem is the flesh. The flesh is a New Testament shorthand, not just for your skin and bones, but your human resources and abilities but also your habits, your behaviors, your cravings, 
and your appetites, your little power pack, your miniature kingdom that gets in the way of the rhythms of the Spirit going on inside you. Jesus is instructing us. He's saying, why is prayer so difficult sometimes? Well, your heart is into it. It's the rest of you. It's the ingrained habits that you have developed over years and years and years that are in conflict with these new habits that you're attempting to instill. Neuroscientists have discovered that distraction is fueled in part by a chemical reaction in the brain called dopamine. You know what dopamine is? It's that chemical in the brain that rewards you for doing something hard or challenging, and it's awesome. It's the reason why some of you go to work out, even though it's difficult and challenging. It's that feeling you get after surmounting something very challenging or difficult that makes you want to go back and do it over and over and over. It's also the thing behind our addictions. It's that good feeling of fleeting pleasure that we get when we fall to something. Every time you sit down in prayer and you turn on your phone and look at the ding or check your timeline or look at the news, a rush of dopamine is being sent through your brain, rewarding you. You know what that means? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Distraction begets distraction. We're actually addicted to it. We can't just turn it off overnight. The only way that we can break bad habits is by adopting new rhythms that will replace them. For some of you, that just means starting small, turning off your phone, turning off the news, whatever that looks like, turning off uh, whatever it is that normally grabs your attention, and even if it's for five minutes, just sitting there in the presence of God, even if you don't feel anything and nothing is happening. Why? Because it's more than just an occasional experience. It's about building habits so that your mind, once you sit down in the presence of God, immediately opens up to the things of God and you begin to build new habits because you're adopting new rhythms. I'm going to ask Robert and Colette to come out as we sing. I want to give you a quick summary. And I want to give you a way to step forward into this. In the same way that my heart was filled with interacting with a loved one, Prayer is simply an interaction with God. As Jesus beckons us by his invitation, just abide in me. I want to know you. Perhaps our shame could be offset a little bit, knowing that he loves you and he's not ashamed of you. Perhaps our feeling that our prayers are ineffective and broken could be offset a little bit knowing that God is near to you and he's present and he's working even when it doesn't seem like he is and even when life doesn't make sense. Perhaps the busyness of our life can be a little offset in our prayer knowing that even in your busyness God will accept it as an act of prayer if you would simply turn your attention to God even if it's for a second. Maybe our distractions can be slowly disarmed over time. After years and years, this may be what it'll take. By adopting new rhythms today. Small rhythms, inspiring rhythms, doable rhythms, but rhythms nonetheless in which we are saying, even if it's just for five seconds, I'm going to do this every day to retrain my mind to thirst after and long for God. so with that in mind, I want to ask you a question to begin to draw out some of those desires in your heart. The first question is this, where, was, uh, where did you last sense God's nearness in your life? Maybe it was yesterday, maybe it was last week, maybe it was a year ago, maybe it was years ago. I don't care when it was, I just want you to pinpoint that moment. When did you last sense God's nearness in your life? And I want you to begin to interrogate that ask yourself this, why? What opened up for me to sense God's nearness? For example, you might have, you might have sensed his nearness when you were walking uh, on the beach looking at a sunset. But maybe it's not really about the beach. Maybe it's not really about the sunset, but the fact that you turned everything else off, that put, people couldn't distract you, they couldn't get your time. 
You didn't have your phone. You didn't have your laptop. And in that moment, your attention was open before God. I want you to get to the reason behind some of those interactions with God because this is important. This is going to be important for you. Where did you last sense God's nearness in your life? And what was it about that that was so unique? Think about that for a few seconds. As you begin to explore that question, I want you to begin asking a second question. How can you take what God provided to you in that moment and turn it into a rhythm? Where did you last sense God's nearness in your life? What was so unique about that situation? And how can you turn that into a rhythm? And here's going to be my challenge for you today. For the remainder of this series, I want to take whatever God has been showing you about that, and I want you to do it twice a day until we're done with this series. Even if nothing happens, even if you don't feel anything, even if it doesn't feel like it's working, even if you don't hear his voice, because the most important thing that you and I can do when an invitation like abide in me is offered to us is simply show up and to keep showing up until something breaks. I believe with all of my heart that God desperately desires to pour himself out onto your life. And everything that you need to pray and to speak to him and to encounter him has already been provided to you in his son, Jesus Christ, who brought the kingdom close to you when he came to this earth and died and rose again. Let's spend the next few minutes learning simply to open 